Good morning. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, hope you can hear me. Welcome to this session on smart, uh, smart specialization in the uh, JTF regions. This session is looking to be very interesting. It is a, a mixture or a combination of uh, two major uh, elements of, of European policy where innovation and uh, a just transition uh, is, uh, is combined. I mean, the Commission has a, a great challenge or a, a great vision or a very challenging vision uh, ahead, ahead of it uh, in order to uh, reach a carbon neutral 2050. Uh, and in order to do that, business as usual will just not work. Uh, for that, we will need uh, breakthrough innovation. Uh, and this breakthrough innovation and changes and transition will need to be, uh, will need to consider all the local assets and the local particularities uh, that the regions have. And this is where smart specializations uh, come into play. Smart specialization is uh, one of these important principles that uh, in, the, in the EU on cohesion policy we do use and we try to focus efforts uh, uh, when it comes to investments into innovation. Smart specializations do take uh, in, in, um, in account the local assets, strengths, uh, and it pulls together uh, all the players and the relevant stakeholders that can do, can, that can make a change. So during this session, we will explore uh, whether there is any particularities in the JTF regions when it comes to smart specialization priorities, uh, and whether smart specialization has been considered and used uh, by the regions in order to further their just transition uh, they just transition plans or pathways. Uh, we will have an, uh, uh, an introductory presentation uh, of a study uh, that uh, uh, we have uh, contracted, uh, which focuses on smart specialization strategy, strategies across the EU. And we will hear some specificities or whether we can draw any conclusions uh, when it comes to the JTF regions, whether they are special, whether they are uh, part in particular uh, con um, characteristics when it comes to the choice of their smart specialization strategies. And then we will have a lively discussion with, uh, with, the, uh, with representatives of regions uh, on, their, uh, on their vision and their experience and lessons learned when it comes to smart specialization strategies and combining and using it uh, in order to further uh, their uh, just transitions. Uh, we managed to uh, get regions which are uh, coming both from uh, carbon intensive as well as uh, uh, regions that have been they are trying to transit out uh, of fossil fuel production. So hopefully uh, this will uh, uh, be an interesting uh, uh, discussion as well as we managed to get uh, um, countries from uh, uh, all over the EU, so it will not be concentrated only on this or that region. We have Portugal, uh, the Netherlands, as well as uh, Czechia uh, here invited. Uh, and before uh, we, we get to do, to, into those discussions, you can, of course, ask your questions in the meantime, and we will see how we pick those up uh, during the session. So be active uh, and uh, bear with us until your uh, well-deserved lunch break. So without much further ado, I would like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Jan Friedrich Kramer, uh, who will give us, uh, provide us with a context uh, on how smart specialization strategies uh, uh, have been uh, used in the, uh, in the JTF regions. So Jan Philippe, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Monica, for this uh, kind uh, introduction. A warm welcome also from my side. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, today. Uh, and uh, I imagine a full room of people. Now we are in a virtual format. But nevertheless, it's a great, great pleasure for me to present to you uh, some findings uh, of a study, as Monica introduced, that we've um, done for the European Commission. Uh, over the last year, um, where we looked at all of the uh, 180 something smart specialization strategies across the EU, uh, focusing on the 2014 20 period. And um, for today's presentation, we have uh, done a special investigation for the JTF regions in order to understand, as Monica said, uh, what is special about them, how do they differ as compared also to 
the overall findings of our study. It was a study done uh, in collaboration with our colleagues at CSIL um, and uh, great thanks also to, to them for the work done. Looking at the agenda um, on the next slide, we have prepared uh, a few points. We want to understand, of course, what are the key questions? What do we want to show today? But more importantly, I want to speak about the prioritization in the S3 uh, strategies of the JTF regions. I want to show you a little bit about the um, correspondence of these choices that were made in the strategies as compared to what the regional profile looks like in, in different dimensions. And lastly, we want to speak about um, the implementation of three S3 priorities uh, so in terms of projects and funding, all for the 2014 and 20 um, period, as I said. Now, <clears throat> looking at our map on the next slide, you are all aware that the European Commission has suggested a number of uh, specific regions with a specific profile. And Monica has already outlined that we also have different regions here presented in our session today from those with a focus on, on, on uh, fossil fuel production or fuel-based energy generation, the carbon intensive, or even a combination of both. And the underlying regulation also clearly says, now looking forward to the 2021-27 period, that smart specialization is a key pillar in the development of the territorial just transition plans. And uh, so our analysis will now look at the selected JTF regions or due to the governance uh, and, and the, the, the corresponding regional scale at regions that comprise um, also those uh, JTF uh, regions. The objectives on the next slide are, I would say, relatively straightforward. Overall, we want to understand how does S3 or how can S3 strategies help with the just transition, right? And also help with the territorial just transition plans. Looking back, we want to answer what priorities have been selected in the JTF regions. We want to understand whether these priorities are reflecting the regional profile of the JTF regions. And finally, and as a very important point, um, have JTF regions directed um, funds into these priorities in order to support economic diversification. And that's, as you know, a very fundamental pillar. Um, on the scope, I will be very brief on the next slide. I just want to say that we do have uh, a very large amount of data underlying this assessment. We have looked at all of the 185 S3 strategies. We have uh, compiled a very large prioritization database. We have uh, created uh, a database on projects um, which com uh, comprise over 2,800 ERDF calls. And so we have a lot of uh, evidence uh, to build uh, our assessment on. Now let's come to the to the uh, real insights. Um, I said uh, as a first research question, and we, we can move to the next slide, we want to understand what is the focus of the smart specialization strategies in the just transition regions. And um, we have looked at this from two perspectives. One is more, um, uh, let's say, technical orientation. You see that on the left-hand side. And the other is, is a more uh, bottom-up view. So let's start with the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, you see the top five uh, research fields, the top five technology areas, and the top five economic sectors that were addressed um, by the uh, S3 priority areas in the JTF regions. And here uh, we, we looked at it from a more broad perspective, so we allowed multiple assignments uh, per priority area. You can see for all of those uh, dimensions, research, technology, or sectors, that they tend to have a strong technology, ICT, or engineering focus. And this is, in fact, something which is uh, the way across all of the EU. It doesn't differ between the JTF regions and uh, the EU27 on, on the larger scale. But we also see that, and that's something more peculiar for the JTF regions, that, uh, for instance, on the, under the research fields, we find something like tourism, under the top sectors, we find something like manufacturing of food products. And this is something also less technology intensive that we see there as compared uh, to the overall picture. 
Now on the right hand side, I said it's a bit more a bottom up perspective. Here we looked at uh, the description of the S3 priority areas uh, with a uh, topic modeling algorithm. And you see here um, the, the most important topics addressed by the priority areas. And you will see also in the percentage, what is the comparison between the uh, JTF regions and the overall U27 in our analysis. Now on the three most important um, priorities, um, we have the same for the EU and the JTF regions, in fact, with slightly differences in the percentage shares. So the most important one is, in fact, agri-food and bio bioeconomy. And uh, this is something, as I said, both for, for the JTF and the U27. The second most important is ICT and Industry 4.0. And the third one is health and life science. I think the first one is, is quite expected. Uh, the second one also, the third one, uh, it is also illustrating the importance that this will, will have in the future. I was a bit surprised when looking at this analysis <clears throat> that for, for, for the JTF regions in particular, the topic of energy, but also the topic of clean tech and circular economy is of rather low importance. And that's something we should uh, also uh, look into in the future. Now, on the next slide, I want to speak about um, the question of granularity, maybe a bit technical here, but a very important topic that we need to understand. So overall, uh, one thing that we understand as a key uh, pillar of smart specialization strategies is that they are granular, that they identify specific priorities which are uh, also unique or at least uh, very specific for the territory we're talking about. So a granular approach to prioritization leads also to a better impact. That's what we believe in terms of channeling, channeling the, the funding into areas where you can generate critical mass. And on average, if we look at the um, priorities overall, we see that uh, uh, each region on average has five priority areas that it's selected. But that doesn't really tell us enough in order to understand um, what is really behind this, because the absolute number of priorities can be misleading. There could be very specific underlying multi-level structures. So we need to find out um, more specifically uh, in how is the thematic broadness of the strategy. And we do, with, do this with uh, the so-called bandwidth index. And uh, this index is very simple. It's a percentage share. And you see this also on the map that I show on the left-hand side. Uh, and it goes from zero to 100. If it's uh, low, you have a low bandwidth. If it's a high thematic broadness, you have a high percentage. So relatively easy. Interestingly, we find that the JTF regions manage to be a bit more specific about their priority areas. So they have a bandwidth index of 66% as compared to more than 70% as the EU average. So they have a medium to low uh, bandwidth uh, as a characterization. So everything you see on the map, which is in the blue colors to the yellow colors. And um, so that's, I think, an interesting message. And uh, we have one representative later speaking from the North Netherlands, which uh, is quite interesting to see. They defined a very clear set of priorities and they found a very specific uh, uh, logic in their strategy uh, illustrated by a narrow bandwidth. But I also need to say that we uh, cannot, you know, compare the JTF regions uh, just as one, um, unique uh, entity, but we also see some regions which uh, have a rather broad approach to their prioritization. Uh, this is illustrated uh, here below Côte d'Azur in France, for instance, or also Calais or Austria, which have a rather high um, um, uh, bandwidth index, um, but much less than, than other regions uh, in the EU27, in fact. So this is the, the question about prioritization. Coming to um, the, the next slide, I want to also come to the next question that we have uh, illustrated in the beginning. So the question is, to what extent are the chosen priorities in line with the regional profile? And that's very important because we want that the, 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 the priorities selected also reflect the endogenous innovation capacities of regions, right? 
And uh, we, we did a quite complex analysis to, to uh, understand this, investigating the correspondence of the selected priorities in the strategy with the scientific, with the technological and the economic profiles of the regions. Uh, and then uh, run a cluster analysis to understand how uh, homogeneous groups of regions look like. We have four groups um, and we see that uh, in fact uh, out of our uh, JTF regions 23% uh, seem to align very closely with their scientific profile. Um, this is uh, interestingly lower than in the U27. In the U27 the average is 29%. Then we have um, 29% uh, of the regions, which have a strong technological focus, very similar to the EU average, uh, and 23% that are very closely matching with their economic profiles. So they have a close relation to what uh, the economic structure is in their region. And also here, interestingly, this is seven percentage point higher uh, as compared to uh, the uh, EU27 average. So it seems to be one feature of the JTF regions uh, on average that they uh, link their strategies better to the economic uh, profile. Last group, we found uh, a good 25% of, of JTF regions and also the same in fact for the U27 where we don't find any close match, a low correspondence with all profiles. And now you could say that's really bad, um, but you could also say they are more ambitious because they find or focus on areas where which are more unrelated uh, to their current um, uh, structures and they want to uh, push the development. So something uh, to take into consideration and you see on the map it's not a clear pattern. There are regions with different profiles all across uh, the EU. So um, another pillar to this I need to, to speed up a little bit with uh, my, my intervention here. Um, so I will do a bit briefly here on the next slide. Technological ambition, that's something we, we also need to look at because the technological ambition in the strategy also will reflect the potential degree of transformation that can come with the strategy itself. And so we looked at the, the, the um, relation of the priority areas and their technological complexity. Um, the darker the color on the map, the higher uh, the correlation between these two dimensions and the higher the technological ambition of the S3 strategy. And on average, we see that the Western European uh, JTF regions are a bit more uh, ambitious or the other regions are a bit more cautious, depending on how you want to see it. But we also see that the JTF regions, in fact, show a somewhat higher correlation uh, than the uh, other regions and uh, to, to that degree are a bit more ambitious. So something to look at and maybe our colleagues can tell us a bit later about their experiences. I'm coming to the third um, question, which is if you want to put it simple and please next slide, follow the projects and follow the money. And we want to understand in how far the JTF regions have directed their funds into their priority areas through projects and of course also the associated uh, budget because this, this is really crucial to bring the strategy from the theoretical and, and uh, conceptual level to the implementation and that's in fact something we, we didn't know much about uh, before running this study. On this slide you see that uh, when looking at the projects that have uh, a link to their smart specialization priority areas we see that in the JTF regions, around 16,000 projects have been funded uh, with a link to the uh, smart specialization priority areas out of uh, around 33,000, right? So that's a share of 50%. In the EU overall, we are talking about uh, almost uh, 87 um, thousand projects uh, out of which almost 50,000 have been uh, linked to the smart specialization priorities which gives you an, a, a, a share of 57% uh, and you see the difference uh, of seven percentage points here. So uh, also for the JTF regions something to, to uh, work on but the map also shows to you we have regions with a very high share, we have regions with a lower share so it's not a black and white picture obviously. Now on the next slide we uh, show the budget tied to this 
I think the good news is almost 7 billion euros have been allocated uh, into these projects. So that's quite a, a, a relevant share. Overall, in Europe, we're talking about uh, more than 19 billion, uh, which have been linked to the smart spec priority areas. And for the JTF regions, we see, and that or I think is also a good news, uh, that the uh, most important thematic domains that I've shown in the beginning are also reflected in those budgets. So out of the 6.7 billion, around 3.4 billion go into the three priority areas, agri-food and bioeconomy, health, life science, ICT and industry. 4.0. So coming to uh, uh, a short wrap up, um, on the next slide, I have listed uh, four main points and something on the outlook. Um, I've shown to you that the smart spec strategies of the 2014 uh, 2020 period seem to illustrate a good starting point uh, for the uh, territorial just transition plans, but we need to consider the specific governance and territorial scales. I've shown you the most important priority areas uh, and um, also these priority areas offer a room for diversification, but we've also seen, and I said this in the beginning, uh, a striking uh, low focus on energy topics, on clean tech and circular economy. I think this is something to, to further understand. Um, I've also shown to you that uh, JTF regions seem to be ambitious, which is very good, uh, slightly higher uh, as the EU average, um, but there's also a quite broad spectrum um, of uh, unrelated and complex approaches, related and low complex approaches, which needs to be uh, looked at in each individual case. We've seen that uh, just a second ago, 6.7 billion have been channeled into the S3 priorities, but only 50% of the projects uh, are linked to the smart spec priority areas, uh, 57 on EU level. I think there needs to be also a stronger focus uh, in the future. So as a final remark uh, outlook, mm, I think that for the economic diversification we need, especially in the JTF regions, we need, of course, well-identified priorities. There is still some room for, uh, for, for improvement here. We need sound strategy execution. We need an ongoing EDP. And we also need the appropriate governance, especially looking now at the interrelation of the smart spec and the territory just transition plan. And with this, I would like to, to thank you for your attention and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. There are a few points which uh, indeed uh, are worth highlighting and then probably then uh, that's something that the uh, our invited speakers can also uh, have a view on. So you have uh, mentioned a bit the uh, the thematic priorities, which uh, from a perspective are interesting, uh, that they focus on the uh, on the bioeconomy uh, ICT, but less on on energy uh, as such. Also, it's what what, what was interesting to hear uh, that the JTF, JTF regions, at least during the uh, previous uh, financial period, they have been more focused on their uh, smart specialization uh, priorities and also that the, those smart specialization priorities fit much more their economic profile than uh, the EU average. So it will be very interesting to hear from the from our speakers uh, uh, their their uh, specific experiences or lessons learned in their in their regions. Uh, there was a very quick question to you, uh, Jan, whether you do expect and you touched upon it a bit, uh, whether you expect the uh, the smart specialization uh, strategies now being updated for the next period in view of the uh, of the JTF uh, as such. Yes, very, very good question indeed. I, I uh, expect that to happen. Uh, we already saw in the last period that uh, during this uh, uh, funding uh, time, there were updates and now looking at the overall updates, but also the more um, regional specific analysis that needs to be done uh, for the JTF regions, there will also become uh, some very peculiar points uh, reflecting their um, economic history and also their, their potential to diversify that will also influence uh, the update of the smart specialization strategies. That, that would be my hope and also uh, in a way expectation. Okay, thank you. And now let me uh, let me present you uh, our esteemed uh, uh, 
panel. Uh, first, uh, we will hear uh, statements, and we will be uh, uh, we'll be curious to hear uh, the individual statements of uh, of our uh, uh, speakers. Uh, on uh, how they see their smart specialization strategy combined with their uh, just transition uh, uh, plans. And uh, first, uh, I will uh, um, ask uh, Mr. Luc Hulsman uh, to uh, um, give a short uh, statement on, on uh, the case of the Northern uh, Netherlands. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Monica. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Jan already made reference to us, the uh, Northern Netherlands uh, region, mentioning the specificness of, of the priority choices we uh, we have made. Um, five choices I saw in the picture. Uh, indeed, of actually, in the new period, we will uh, limit this uh, choice to even to, to four. Um, but I would like to stress there is a context around these these choices. I believe more important than numbers is the, the logic a region chooses. And I would like to share with you kind of the logic we have chosen in my region uh, behind uh, smart specialization and the translation into programs like uh, JTF and, and ERDF. Uh, JTF, of course, it's about transition. It's about climate, but about economics as well. Uh, it's about diversification and I believe you achieve diversification by developing new strengths and developing new strengths is of course the essence of smart specialization and I think the province of Groningen which is one of the provinces in in the region of the northern Netherlands is can be considered maybe as a kind of classic example of a region in transition this province with about 600,000 inhabitants is is moving away from a long term dependency on, on natural gas Actually, until a few years ago, Groningen was one of the largest producers of, of natural gas in, in Europe and had a large uh, industry dependent on, on, on natural gas. It's moving away from this dependency towards an economy uh, based on non-fossil energy sources, in particularly green hydrogen. And when you look at our smart specialization strategy and uh, our history, you will see already in the uh, the previous strategy uh, we developed in, in 2014, transitions or societal challenges are really at the core of our of our strategy and, and still are. And the logic behind is that is that we consider transitions as something that will happen inevitably, no matter what. And the logic is that uh, in our RIS3, in our strategy, we focus not so much on the transition itself, I mean, the realization of this uh, transition, but actually on the economic opportunities these transitions uh, will give up, will give us. And, and in our new uh, smart specialization strategy, we identified four transitions, one being energy, uh, in which we believe we have potential and strong competences to develop new specializations and eventually new strengths. And these transitions, you can consider them as a kind of boundaries of an area in which we expect the biggest opportunities to arise. And the idea is to identify and capitalize on those opportunities within this area in a way you can kind of compare to a process of refinement, so a process of narrowing down, starting relatively broad and eventually specializing, narrowing down to the area which you find out through a continuous EDP process already mentioned by Jan as well, where you have the biggest uh, potential. And I think an example in our region is green hydrogen. We are in the process of building new strengths around green hydrogen. And of course, we're not the only region in Europe doing so, but we believe we have several strong points which might give us an edge over others. Uh, we have a lot of relevant knowledge because of this history in gas. We have a big, some big players like the, the, the National Gas Company. Uh, we have infrastructure built for like pipelines and stuff like that, built for gas, but can also be adapted to you use for, uh, for green hydrogen. And at the moment, big investments are already being made uh, yeah, with the idea to build a full value chain for green hydrogen. And it, it seems that within this area of green hydrogen, the biggest potential for us as a region for Groningen might be in the area of transport and, and storage of, uh, of hydrogen. Um, I'm not an expert in the field, but I believe that in the end, this through this continuous process, the eventual kind of goes with the, old, with the, with the, with the, the golden egg 
might be in an area even smaller than storage or or, or transport and kind of the logic behind our risk free and also the logic uh, behind the, tr the translation of the strategy into implementation programs like JTF, but as well ERDF is to kind of foster this process, foster this process, foster this process of narrowing down of uh, of choices. And the, the challenge, of course, is to create a kind of integrated structure, integrated programming structure where the programs are well aligned to uh, do do this in the in the most efficient and uh, and effective way. And um, for instance, when you look at the European funds available to our region in the coming period, ERDF, uh, the idea we have is to use this ERDF for kind of smaller scale projects, innovation projects, experiments, to try out things um, a bit with the idea to kind of sow several new seeds and JTF instead use for larger project, larger investment projects uh, further along the line to uh, kind of nurture the seeds which have already been uh, been grown within uh, within the region. And um, yeah, really the, the biggest challenge at the moment, and we are working on that uh, in, a, in a pretty uh, consistent way, is how to create this structure of programs which are well aligned to the strategy and programs which where the funds will be used in the most synergetic uh, way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hussman. Uh, obviously, the, the way it looks, I mean, your region has already started the transition much earlier than uh, the JTF as an idea came up. And that can be also seen in the uh, more focused nature of your uh, of your uh, smart specialization strategies when it comes to supporting uh, that transition. Uh, but let's hear then uh, next uh, our next uh, speaker. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Piresh, uh, Anna Piresh from uh, Portugal, uh, and uh, just please provide us uh, your statement uh, about how you see smart specialization and the combination uh, and how it can support the just transition just shortly uh, in your in your country and in your region. Hi, thank you, Monica. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. It's very nice to be here. Um, so the ambitious climate goals set by the European Union require plan and integrated approaches, coordinating efforts at different levels and sectors. In Portugal, the industrial sector is one of the main boosters of the economy. The companies uh, on central region uh, employ a high percentage of the population and are key players in the regional innovation ecosystem. However, they are also one of the main consumers of resources and major greenhouse gas producers. The territorial uh, regional territories and the specific companies with higher levels of emissions have already been identified in the context of the Just Transition Fund. In this context, the territory of Medio Tejo has received the European Commission's approval as a direct recipient of the GTF, particularly due to the closing of the Pego Thermoelectric Plant, a coal fire plant, and the still pending approval from the European Commission, but identified as a challenging territory regarding the impacts of from the needed transition to a climate neutral economy, is also the territorial axis of Leiria, Coimbra and Aveiro. This territorial continuum shows as well significant amounts of EU ETS emissions due to the high concentration of ceramics, glass and pulp and paper industries. The relevance of these sectors for the region dictates a significant degree of potential exposure to the impact of the climate transition. So the territorial just transition plans uh, are still uh, is starting. They will be developed within the regional smart specialization strategy and attending that the decarbonization of the industry is an S3 priority for the region and also one of the four innovation hubs of the central S3 is precisely the development of sustainable industrial solutions. Therefore, the need for action in these territories and these enterprises demand integrated interventions that address the challenges of the twin transitions while guaranteeing no negative social impacts. The approach will then be completely aligned with the regional S3, 
which is driven by the triple transition, digital, green and social, in a straight pathway to the European Green Deal's objectives. Uh, thank you, Monica. Thank you very much. Uh, this, uh, this looks to be a very complex and very logically, structurally uh, built up uh, approach uh, to the transition, considering all the transitions, not only the, uh, the green transition uh, attached to it. But uh, we, can, we already saw also from uh, Jan's presentation that digital can uh, support significantly the green transition. So in that sense, it, uh, it is quite uh, interesting. And now let me uh, give the floor to our uh, third uh, speaker uh, from the Czech Republic, uh, Mr. Zdenek Kusek, uh, to, uh, to give us a, a short statement about uh, how smart specialization and uh, the just transition is looked at in Czechia. So thank you for the floor. Hello to everybody. Uh, I'd like to use this uh, little bit apocalyptic picture <laughs> about the uh, presentation of, uh, let's say, transformation story of our of our region. So Ustí region is industrial region located in northwest part of uh, Czech Republic. We are about one hour from Prague uh, and to, we are about half an hour to Saxony, Germany, to Dresden or Chemnitz. Uh, and uh, on this picture is a famous castle called in Germany Iceberg. And in uh, you can imagine that in 18 and 19th century, it was the landscape uh, in surrounding of this castle full of gardens, lakes, vineyards. That was the biggest arboretum in Europe. And the castle was visited by people like Goethe, Ludwig van Beethoven, Haydn and so on. But also in this time started the exploitation of uh, lignite or the brown coal in our region. And uh, on this picture is the result. So after 200 years of exploitation of uh, brown coals, uh, you have seen the open mine, you have seen uh, see the power stations, uh, chemistry plant and lot of lot of heavy industries. And uh, just now we are in the point zero because uh, next year will be this mine closed. Uh, so just now we are starting, let's say, the final uh, final period of uh, of uh, exploitation of this of this place. And we are thinking about strategy, about how to connect uh, smart expectation with, with the new opportunities. And we have four pillars. The first uh, will be the system innovations. So something I was mentioned in look presentation. So hydrogen, for example, so the transformation from gray hydrogen to green hydrogen. Uh, second, very important in our region will be the change the industrial mindset. So from uh, from uh, from big companies to small one. Uh, third point is the finding of new energy resources, for example, like uh, geothermal energy. And the uh, last point is uh, landscape revitalization, because we have a lot of troubles you see in our landscape and uh, it will be really a big problem must be solved in, with uh, socio-economical tools and also with environmental tools. So this is basic story of a region and I will talk about it more in, uh, later on. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to highlight actually what point that you mentioned about changing the uh, industrial mindset. I mean, the uh, just transition does have a significant impact of simply people. Uh, and uh, one of the most difficult things to change is the mindset and the people and to make them support the, uh, the transition that uh, you can manage uh, when it comes to te technology or innovation. So uh, that is uh, indeed an interesting point and an important point when it comes to the transition. So now I would like to uh, um, present you an, uh, an additional speaker because we, will go, uh, we are going to open now the, uh, the, the panel for all speakers. We do have also uh, joining us, Ms. Radana Kratochvilova. I mean, the uh, the first three speakers that you've heard, uh, they are coming from a specific region, but uh, uh, Ms. Kratochvilova will be able to also provide us a bit with the perspective from the from the member state, from the national uh, level. So uh, I would like to open now uh, the floor and I would like to uh, um, 
put the question on, on the vision uh, for your countries. We have already heard uh, some elements from, uh, from you uh, on the vision, what, what you see when it comes to the, the role of smart specialization uh, in the just transition. And, it would be, and I would be curious to listen from all of you, uh, what, is the, the, what is that vision? How could you summarize that vision for your region and for uh, your country? Uh, and I would actually like to start then uh, with uh, Ms. Kratofilova. So what do you see it for, for Czechia uh, as a whole? Thank you very much. Yes, I'm the representative of the, of the national uh, uh, body, uh, the ministry, which is responsible now for the operational program, uh, Just Transition. Uh, but we work closely together with the colleagues from uh, from uh, from other ministries who are responsible for the just transition plans, which come from the regions, and that's the crucial principle that we communicate with the regions. And of course, the bottom-up approach is 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 the key uh, to to success. And also with the with the other colleagues from from Ministry of uh, Trade and Industry, who are responsible for the methodology of the S3 uh, strategies. Um, we're not starting at, uh, at like zero point now because the S3 strategies have been here already the, 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 the past programming period or this programming period, which is now finishing. And also the regions uh, for for the Czech Republic it is actually three regions that, that are involved in the process of just transition. It's not only uh, Usti, uh, but also Karlovy Vary and uh, Moravian Silesian region, and um, which is kind of special. And uh, uh, already uh, some six years ago. We have started together with the regions uh, an economic transition strategy, uh, which also was combined uh, or or linked to the S3 strategies and the goals that need to be set up for these three, three regions. And we can see that it's not only process for like two or six years. This will be a long term process. And now we see that um, uh, for this opportunity that we have to use the special uh, operational program uh, based on uh, special plans, of course, the the S3 strategies come closely together. Uh, we um, uh, we combine them, and um, uh, the areas of specializations are reflected in the proposals of the type interventions of the tr uh, transition plans of all the three regions. They come jointly in, in one plan and uh, it helps us to define the potential fields of for, for contribution to the uh, necessary diver diversification uh, because the regional economies are very vulnerable in these in these cases. Um, and uh, of course, it reflects the whole country if we uh, if we uh, don't support them and we uh, do not have the one necessary uh, level of, of uh, economical uh, development and uh, growth actually in all the regions, then the whole country uh, will not grow as, as we would wish to. Uh, so this is very important that we, we work with them together and uh, but from from uh, the national point of view, the just transition plans are not the only, uh, uh, or the operational program is the, not, not the only source of the of the S3 strategies. Uh, there has to be other sources, of course, and uh, um, uh, we will we will focus probably on the uh, more com complicated projects, or um, from from our point of view. Uh, uh, outside of the S3 strategies, the the, the projects that are like uh, not supported from 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 other uh, sources. So these are like the two ways that we will uh, we will follow. So thank you for for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hushek. Do you have anything to add from a regional perspective? What is the vision uh, for Usti region? As I mentioned it in my first presentation, so we have these four pillars. And uh, first of all, it's necessary to find some, uh, let's say, this uh, game changers, so some system innovation, so something quite, quite new uh, in the region. And uh, this is, for example, this uh, hydrogen economy. 
Uh, but we have also important uh, part in our uh, in our S3 strategy. It's a uh, chemistry, uh, so we are focused now on on green tech and also on so-called green chemistry. So the uh, uh, let's say make the chemical process more less energy less energy uh, difficult. Uh, also, it's important to find uh, uh, new resources for energy, uh, especially based on endogen, uh, endogen resources. So we have uh, a quite interesting shared infrastructure called Ringen. It's a, it's a consortium of Academy of Science and two research universities, and they are working on a topic like geothermal energy and very interesting the underground energy storage. And uh, quite new, but also um, interesting could be uh, the lithium and battery battery cluster, because we have in the region some uh, some resources of lithium for battery production. Uh, so this is two domains focus more on on this big industry. Uh, so third point is oriented to small and medium enterprises, and we'd like to open open uh, for these companies. Let's say the international market with technology transfer because our region is, uh, um, let's say, moderate innovator. So uh, we have our our innovative innovation capacity is lower than in other region. But on the other hand, we are close to Prague. We are close to close to Saxony. Uh, so important part of our transformation process will be this internalization of companies and uh, creating the special financial tools and mentoring programs for SMEs, uh, especially in this field of uh, new product and new process development. And the last point of our vision is this complex socio-economic environment, environmental uh, changes in landscape. So revitalization projects for uh, mines. We have, for example, project Green Mine, which is uh, prepared for this uh, uh, surrounding of Castle iceberg so for the revitalization of this idea so this is our four main pillars for our strategy for our vision uh, thank you very much uh, i would also like to now ask uh, Ms. piresh uh, so what is the vision uh, when it comes to smart specialization and uh, uh, the jtf uh, in your region so in central region, the transition to a carbon neutral economy was perceived as demanding a territorial approach, a process that must be integrated in the regional strategy policy, working under the priorities of the S3. Insofar as this transition calls for new pro uh, knowledge production and development of innovative solutions. Therefore, the GTF will be integrated in the regional operation program, enabling a joint action and the mobilization of instruments that are suitable for the target territories to tackle the challenges posed by the carbon neutrality transition. In view of this transition, priorities must be defined for these territories, identifying the resources and how they can be effective in a sustainable way. The priorities defined in the S3 were actually designed to encourage the transition to a sustainability understood in a broad sense. It can be stated that the Central's S3 is really a S4, a smart specialization strategy for sustainability. So the priorities were defined along with global transversal challenges, among which the green transition stands out. Um, and also with the digital and social transition. In defining its specialization priorities, Central's S3 identifies transformative agendas including the development of sustainable industrial solutions and the promotion of uh, territorial innovation in order not to leave territories behind. And these, we believe, are special relevant for the GTF target territories. Thus, through the uh, regional operation program, we expect to support projects aligned with our S3 priorities, having as a vision the development of sustainable process, materials, systems with greater added value for our region, also the efficient use of resources, reduction of the environment impact of production process and throughout the life cycle of products and systems, the industrial modernization through circular economy and decarbonization, 
through digitalization and integration of advanced technologies, and also through the production centered in the human being. It should also be noted that some of these projects might also receive some support from the European Social Fund, namely to address the issue of reskilling that these transitions demands from workers, creating a, a real synergy between funds. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Piresh. Uh, you've also touched upon a few points which uh, are uh, appearing now in the chat. So uh, um, when uh, I will also give the floor to uh, Ms. Hus Mr. Hussman on, uh, on the region for, for the uh, Netherlands, though, the Northern Netherlands, though, those elements we have already heard. It would be interesting to also, if you could, uh, if you could uh, um, reflect on, uh, on how the uh, smart specialization uh, strategies match uh, the choices because I mean these are choices when you select one smart uh, to go for certain areas in smart specialization. So what, how do those match uh, the, the the people? So the uh, the no one left behind uh, element uh, as well as uh, it was uh, brought up the gender equality uh, when it comes to transition. And uh, just so that the uh, other speakers don't uh, sit on their laurels, you, you will be also asked the same questions to just reflect a bit also on those elements. So, Ms. Mr. Hulsman. Okay, thanks again, uh, um, Monica. I, I really believe that in my region, uh, uh, working towards this new period, we made a pretty good start in the sense that we made a risk free, which really serves as a kind of basis for the, uh, initially the TTP, but following that, uh, the, the, the Just Transition Plan, but as well the, the, the other programs like uh, like ERDF. And the choices in each program follow almost uh, uh, straight out of the, the choices made in the RISV. Like I said, these transitions, we have chosen four, energy being one, circular economy being uh, another, a positive health and other and, and digital uh, transformation is the is, is the fourth one but maybe i would like to add a little maybe a little bit different perspective to the discussion in the sense that i think an important element in our risk free is that we say of course choices are important and this what i call the what question is important but when you look at our risk free almost half of the pages in our risk free are not so much about the actual choices but about how to make it happen so how to really make sure that in the end as a region we manage to uh, establish new strengths for instance around uh, green hydrogen but about other things as well and this means not only investing in these actual priority areas but also for instance investing in innovation ecosystem things like uh, that and, and kind of more conditional uh, elements which are needed to be uh, to be able to be successful and this is an important element in our risk free, but it would also be an important element in these individual uh, programs. Like, in, in, of course, in, in, in our GTF program, there will be a strong focus on this, uh, this human side. Human capital is an, is an important element, in, uh, especially in the GTF program, because, like I said, we are in a big process of transforming ourselves from a region dependent on one source of, of energy to not only another source of energy, but completed desertification of the economy in this in this problem, which will have a, a, a human element uh, attached to it. So it means that a lot of people have to be re, uh, 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 re educated and, and and things like that. So we have three pillars. So we have three pillars in our in our new. Uh, JTF program, one being these investments I already told about, the second one will be the, the climate aspect and the third one will be the, the human capital aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would actually ask the next question, but then you can uh, please weave in the, the human uh, side uh, of, of your uh, uh, of your plan. So the, you have already been working uh, on your uh, uh, tr just transition plan. So we have also heard it from Ms. Kratochvilova. Uh, when it comes to this, have, do you already uh, have uh, some lessons learned into how 
those plans or the elements that you highlight in your plans uh, will feed into your your definition or adaptation of your smart specialization strategies. And uh, if you allow me, I, I would uh, if uh, well, I would give the floor to uh, uh, Ms. Kratofilova, as uh, you were already referring to the uh, the, the plans on the uh, national level. Yes, thank you. Well, I would say the most difficult part is um, uh, always creating a, a system and uh, and uh, especially in the regions we need to set up an in, in innovation ecosystem and this, this takes time. And uh, so some of the regions are more prepared for this and some some a little bit less. So now we see that, for example, with together with the strategic projects, for example, that are prepared in the regions to to be supported from the operational program. Uh, they are working on this to to create the environment and also the capacities from the region themselves. Uh, so, for example, some transformation centers or transformation institutions that that uh, uh, that, that actually have the the human capital, the people that know uh, and will be capable to to draw the process through throughout the years, because this will be uh, not only one or two or two years. So. Uh, and, and to combine these in institutions in the in the regions, uh, for example, in Karlovarsky Kraj, I think uh, they, they have the, the biggest problems with this. Um, and now they are really uh, they, they they can benefit from the new resources uh, to 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 really boost the process of combining the, the institutions and, and the capital. The other thing is that, of course, we have to work on on the human capital, not only on the high skilled people, but also uh, focusing on the low skilled and uh, to 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 uh, um, uh, to um, let's say aim for their retraining, reskilling, and um, involving them in, in the process. And uh, of course, not leaving them behind. But uh, th this is a thing like how to boost the, 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 the high skilled um, areas and to, to attract the, the high skilled uh, human capital, but not to forget about, about uh, uh, the low skilled too. So that's from my side. Thank you. Well, Mr. Hushek, uh, there is a, there is a, a lot of I mean closing minds uh, in in particular uh, in your region that that must have some challenges. Do you uh, on, on the human side on, on also one side uh, and uh, also on uh, when it comes to the uh, the plans, the just transition plans for your region. Uh, how how does that? Uh, uh, what are the lessons learned so far when it comes to the smart specialization strategies? Do they feed back and forth uh, actually in between them? Uh, yes, the problem. I think the problem of human resources is typical for all the all the coal mine regions. Uh, so um, we we have I think one one uh, small advantage we have. Uh, uh, University, which is focused on on uh, andragogy and pedagogy, and so especially for topics like inclusion, for example, and so we decided to prepare two strategic projects. One is focused on uh, on let's say long life training. It's uh, prepared by consortia of labor office and different uh, different uh, vocational schools, and we have another strategic project which is focused on this process of transformation of this changing of mindset and uh, changes of attitude of people to, to let's say, work in different environments. So, uh, but I must say that that's all this, pro this project will be experiment, experimental. So, so it's, um, I don't think that there are uh, some good practice because each country have a little bit different attitude, uh, different people. Uh, different attitude to this approach. So yes, uh, we understand that this is a problem, but uh, please ask me after three years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very good. I mean, obviously these transition processes are at different times uh, in your regions and in your countries, and that also makes an interesting conversation. And of course, experimenting is good. Yeah. 
uh, that's how we, uh, that's innovation also about. So uh, thinking out of the box and coming up with new ideas and see whether some regions uh, 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 lessons learned from an experimentation can be used in, in, in other regions. So Ms. Piresh, so what, uh, what what are the key lessons learned uh, for you uh, until now when it comes to the plans and the smart specialization uh, strategies? And if you can also reflect a bit more on whether gender uh, specificities or gender the impact on gender equality has been considered or do you see anything emerging in that area that could be interesting to hear? So we are uh, still in the in the um, process of starting uh, to draw our plans, but uh, but the, the this process will be associated with the logic of uh, the S3 uh, model that is a, an open and collaborative framework co-created with the participation of the region's entities. Um, so all the logic associated with this uh, S3 process may and shall be mobilized to the uh, plan's construction. Uh, transformative agenda is key, and in that way, uh, the S3 model has a process that benefited from the involvement of all regional stakeholders, has been serving as an inspirational process, as well as a methodological tool. Uh, this is crucial to give a very clear direction to the wished agenda and to be able to face the challenges. So uh, Centro's S3 is a, a, an inclusive model, a collaborative one. So um, this is um, being used as the working strategy to discuss, to build a collective, a collective strategic framework to, for the transition to the circle economy. For instance, this is the basis of the region's agenda for circle economy. What is at stake here is to zoom in the exercise for these particular territories, promoting entrepreneurial discovery process uh, focused on their specificities and huge challenges. The previous work developed is the starting point, and that was also the starting point of the H2020 project screen, which consortium central region integrated along with other 16 European regions who have as well the circle economy in their regional S3 priorities. Um, I, I, I'm giving this example to, um, to uh, illustrate better uh, the experience we have, we have drawn from this uh, project. The main aim of this uh, screen project was to define a replicable systemic approach towards a transition to circle economy in regions within the context of S3 and to promote synergies among them. Using the methodology that was de developed within this project, it was possible to analyze the regional main value chains where this transition is crucial and to promote meetings with sectorial stakeholders in order to identify the major hotspots and constraints of the sectors, working in close cooperation to understand how these obstacles could be overturned. So in summary, uh, we think that the cooperation and collective collaboration are crucial to accomplish a common vision regarding the demand transitions. We believe that this must be the foundation of the, the plans, the, the, trans, the, the territorial just transition plans uh, that need to acknowledge the resources that are available in the territory and to build on these resources to create a roadmap to lead to exit strategy for the identified territories. We also need an adequate policy mix to uh, finance the projects that materialize this transition instruments that should be integrated and tailored to meet the local needs. In this regard, we have applied for a call of expression of interest promoted by European Commission in, in partnership with the World Bank for support on impact evaluation of S3. Our proposal that was approved is to assess prospectively the effectiveness of uh, this intervention, uh, industrial innovation for this transition. And uh, let me also, uh, I would like also to say that uh, this transition is unavoidable, uh, but it can be a just transition. This, 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 the word of the fund is not for, is not for mere chance. It, it must be, in fact, a just transition. And in that regard, we can, we have to focus on the social impact of this transition because the, the, uh, a transition to a carbon neutral economy uh, must not 
happen at, at the expenses of the um, of people's life of people's employment and so this this there is a broad aspect of uh, the the social dimension that we have to consider and that also cons then that also uh, means consider the impact the, the the role of the, the gender the role of the uh, dignified uh, employment and uh, we think that is a, a a huge challenge for all regions thank you monica uh, thank you very much. Uh, you raised also the, the, the word co collaboration, cooperation uh, in many aspects. One of them is the cooperation and inclusivity uh, and including all the relevant stakeholders uh, in, in uh, defining the plans as well as in uh, defining the smart specialization strategies. I mean, uh, if, uh, if you would like them to be implemented, and, uh, uh, then you do need to involve uh, the parties feel that it's their own, uh, their their, uh, in, their contribution is part of it, they will believe in it and then it will be uh, more interesting or more uh, easy to implement. And that's the same case for a transition, unless you, uh, this is, the leaving behind is not just, uh, not just a word, but uh, having those uh, stakeholders be part of the transition and feeling that they have a say is equally important. The other cooperation or collaboration that I took out of your uh, intervention was uh, interregional. So it's about regions cooperating together. I mean, you do have, you face the same transition uh, in your own ways, uh, but you can always find similarities and things that you can learn from the other. You can also collaborate on, on projects jointly. I mean, technology, uh, hydrogen, uh, things like that are all areas where uh, some of you have the pieces uh, of the puzzle and by uh, getting together, uh, indeed, it it may help everyone uh, a bit uh, better. So, uh, and uh, still, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Hulsman uh, on uh, on what are the key lessons learned uh, in your region when it comes to the uh, plans and smart specialization. Okay, thank you, uh, Monica. Um, I'm a, myself. I'm a program manager. I'm heavily involved in the design of strategies, the design of of programs, and I would like to share with you a few, few kind of practical lessons uh, we have learned and by the way stakeholder involvement is really a key feature in, in our risk free as will be in the design and implementation of the programs we are building on at the moment and and maybe a few practical lessons we have learned in this process we started about two years ago is that first of all timing is, is pretty important good timing is pretty important in the sense that we managed this time and we didn't manage in the previous period to plan and execute kind of the, the, the design of our new risk-free and the TATP and following the, 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 the program and EADF programs as a kind of nice sequence of events. And we finished with this risk-free uh, already early uh, summer last year, so more than a year ago. And uh, we delivered our TATP this summer, one year later. And the fact that the risk-free was already finished the moment we started with the TATP really gave us an advantage we didn't have in the previous period and, and it enabled us really to incorporate the key features elements of this risk free really well into TTP and programs uh, as well and th this is one element and a, a second element I would like to mention is that what we have learned over the past two years is that it's pretty important to create links between processes and not only processes but in particular links between people involved in these uh, in these processes when you look at the previous period about five six years ago the design of the risk free and the design of the programs were pretty separate things uh, implemented actually by 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 different people and as a consequence kind of the essence of risk is the risk got a bit lost in the translation towards these uh, these programs and we changed that this period we changed in the sense that we deliberately created overlap overlap in processes but moreover overlap in the people involved so several of the people who were actually involved in design of the risk free are at the moment involved in the process uh, designing uh, this just transition program and as well the erdf program in our, in our region and so far this has really really paid off so these are the two elements i would like to to mention thank you uh many thanks uh before going into the next question uh I would like to ask the audience, please uh, jot down your questions. I'm sure you have loads of them uh, in your heads and we are really, we would like to uh, 
get this uh, conversation in, in the uh, direction that is uh, interesting for you. So please uh, feel free to ask questions. There are no dumb questions, yeah, just uh, just for your information. Uh, so let me then, uh, until we wait for those uh, great questions coming in, uh, so until now we've been uh, um, focusing on the positive uh, elements, on the on the lessons learned, on the on the things that uh, were very positive. But I'm I'm sure transition is not an easy easy ride. So what are the challenges that you have that you have to face uh, until now? Uh, what are the main challenges that you see uh, when it comes to the um, uh, to your region in this whole uh, process? So uh, and. Uh, I just uh, shuffle a bit the order, and uh, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Piresh to uh, to uh, uh, to tell us a bit about the challenges uh, that you see. Uh, so, uh, Central Region faces two different kind of challenges with regards to this process. First, first the challenge for uh, Mediterranean territory, which is related with the closure of Pego plant. Uh, which will have a strong direct and indirect impact, bringing more exposure to a territory that has already a low sectorial diversification and uh, an adverse demographic dynamic. Secondly, another kind of challenge is related with the territorial axis of Leiria, Coimbra, Aveiro, where there is an high, a high concentration of ceramics and glass industry, mostly SMEs who employ a high percentage of the population and that still do not plan doing investments dedicated to carbon neutrality. This is very concerning insofar as it shows a lack of awareness about the challenges of the climate and energy transition that this kind of industry is exposed to. On the other hand, Mediuteju presents specific challenges and needs regarding employment and the territory economy that must be addressed now. Regarding employment, the direct and indirect jobs affected by the closure. Um, but, but let me say that this process of PEGO plant closing uh, or reconversion is not new. In the last two years, half of their working force was relo re relocated successfully. But currently, there are still around 150 workers, direct and indirect jobs, who need to be absorbed by another company or other companies or projects. And that, that this is a huge challenge. Also, regarding the impact of PEGO central closing in uh, the, this territory economy, uh, the territory is highly dependent on polluting industries. The transition to a decarbonized, modernized digital economy will firstly imply social challenges, but also the diversification of the economic foundation of the region. This diversification must be done attending as three priorities already uh, mentioned, focusing the, in decarbonization, renewable energy, circular economy, and valorization of indigenous natural resources. So in summary, both territories face specific challenges that must be addressed with the same degree of involvement. Due to the closing of PEGO plant in a few weeks, the territory of Medio Tejo presents immediate needs that pose different challenges when comparing to the territorial axis of Leiria Coimbra Aveiro. But in the medium long run, the later will forcibly have to face the impacts of the demand transition, putting at risk working stations, international competitiveness, as well as the local and regional economy, if no measures for the decarbonization process are taken. Thank you, Monica. Uh, thank you. So uh, we always come back to people, uh, as I see. That is, uh, I think, one of the main, main challenges is to get the people uh, low, dem I mean, demographic situation, uh, low diversification, skills, uh, quick upskilling, uh, reskilling, etc. So we always uh, end up somehow with the uh, with the people when it comes to the transition. Well, I would like to uh, ask now, Mr. Husman. So, what are the uh, the challenges when it comes to uh, uh, the area of Groningen? Uh, thanks again, Monica. I would once again, I would like to answer this question from my perspective as 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 a, as a, as a program manager involved in designing uh, strategies and programs and. Uh, I think, to be honest, we 
already have faced several challenges, but the bigger challenges are still ahead of us in in, um, in the sense that we have still have some difficult questions to answer. Uh, for instance, how to design and plan and, and implement a kind of integrated uh, package of support instruments from various sources, European, ERDF, JTF, but from national and, and regional uh, sources as well, and how to direct all this money in a kind of integrated way to the most promising initiatives the coming coming seven years and how to achieve that the end result in seven years time is it's more than just just the sum of individual projects we, we have been supporting during all those those years and for me the optimal outcome of this would be kind of you, know, you can call it a real string of, of projects interconnected initiatives working towards this and narrowing down this 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 eventual specialization we are aiming uh, aiming for and this is not an easy objective and i think to a large degree it will depend on us managing to create an effective form of governance within our region i mean public authorities but uh, a strong involvement of, of our stakeholders uh, as well and universities uh, companies, uh, SME organization, intermediaries, and, 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 and so on. And again, risk-free and the structure we have curated there can be helpful in this uh, respect. To be honest, what doesn't help is, I believe, is the time pressure put on us in delivering the programs. They need to commit and spend quickly. Uh, it's a technical matter, but it has influence on the choices we make. And, and that's a pity, I believe. And what doesn't make it easy either is that in my country, there are differences in responsibilities regarding the different EU funds. Uh, EDR, ERDF is a fully regional responsibility. Uh, ESF Plus will be a national responsibility. JTF will be somewhat in between with a national managing authority and, and regional intermediate bodies. And a big challenge for all of us, the region and, and, and uh, national government alike, is to how to avoid creating inefficiencies during this process in, in the coming years. And, and this is a challenge we are we are taking on. And I, again, I think this this uh, basis we have created with a strategy, a uh, risk-free strategy, can be really helpful there. So, thank you. Thank you. It's uh, in, in, indeed a transition is a journey and uh, programs, projects, uh, individual actions somehow need to all be part of it and uh, take us in a direction uh, which is the transition itself. Uh, you also uh, mentioned urgency and we also heard Ms. Ms. Piresh uh, uh, mentioning urgency but in a different context. So your urgency was how to spend uh, the big pocket of the bucket of money that uh, suddenly arrived and still remains strategic in how it is spent. And the other urgency is the lack of sense of urgency in uh, some areas or some regions or some cities uh, when it comes to the, uh, the importance of the transition. So uh, just to uh, finish up the regional perspective, then uh, Mr. Buschek, uh, what would be the uh, challenges that you see in your particular region? Uh, I've mentioned our, our main, uh, let's say, challenge. Uh, this is this industrial mindset. So we have not only this power stations and uh, open mines, but we have also a huge industry zones with company in uh, automotive industry, Nexen tires or Panasonic. And uh, this is really imprint in mind of citizens, politicians and industry managers that uh, the, that is necessary to support these big companies. And these big companies expect that the funds will be used, especially for solving internal problems like uh, energy pricing, energy consumption, decarbonization of, of uh, let's say, in the chemical industry. Uh, and in, in this environment, it's very difficult to explain why it's necessary to support SMEs or things, for example, like creative industries. It's something very strange for 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 uh, for people uh, which has this uh, industrial mindset. Uh, but on the other hand, but I think that situation is step by step changing. So uh, we we discuss these points with uh, with people, with industry managers, with politicians, and um, I think that this mindset will be step by step change in future. <laughs> but it's still it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. <laughs> This is a question when uh, the how, how many generations will have to pass until that mindset is actually uh, uh, changed. Uh, I would like to now see Ms. Kratohilova, what do you see slightly different uh, or what do you see on the, when it comes to the national level uh, and the, the, the challenges at that level? 
Yes, I already mentioned some some of the challenges, but uh, as as we we look at the three three regions, um, which uh, which have um, I would say uh, a common uh, historical background, uh, as as uh, they they all our three regions are at the borders. Uh, um, um, there are mountain areas, and uh, it um, uh, they have historically uh, been, um, uh, uh, for example, during the Second World War, uh, th th they were cut off the the territory, and uh, the the people have actually changed. Uh, not not all of them have been there for 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 centuries. And uh, I would say that the history is is very important, and the challenge is to actually um, uh, use the traditional um, areas that are uh, in the in the territories and the traditional industries, because all the three regions have actually been in in, uh, in this uh, particular areas, the traditional industries, and to find new direction, uh, new perspective, and uh, so, so that we don't make like jumps but it has to be a smooth process uh, and to combine uh, the traditional ways of, of um, uh, and, uh, and, and the industry and, uh, and uh, going in the new direction. Because, because this also, as we said, concerns the people. If we don't uh, combine it smoothly, then we don't have the people to, 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 to support this process. All right, thank you. Uh, there are some questions coming in. So uh, here it will be the first come first serve. I will just throw in the question. And if you'd like to react with them, please, uh, please uh, feel free to do that. So there was a, quest a question about what are the skills that are most important in your view for the transition in carbon intensive industries, uh, be it technical or not non technical. So what can you say about that? Who would like to go first? Okay, I, I try it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go, go. <laughs> I, I think the main point is now the skills for technical skills for digitization and uh, human skills for how to uh, how to apply these technologies to let's say daily work. So not only the technical skills, but also the, but also the skills for implementation. Okay. Mr. Yeah, I, I fully agree with uh, with uh, Jenek. Um, a few years ago, we had a, a study being done by JRC in our region has project about higher education for for smart specialization. And one of the key conclusions of that study was that in order to really support innovation in our region and really to enlarge the group of SMEs actually involved in R and D. We shouldn't focus as much as we had done on tech technological uh, factors, but more on the human factor in the sense that, uh, like as it should then access uh, applying techn technological innovation and, and combining uh, certain elements of, of uh, technological changes into uh, into uh, into organizations and companies. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Pires. I so so uh, I, I agree with my my colleagues. Um, I think that uh, um, skills uh, will be uh, in our territory will be very very important, important particularly for for green jobs uh, that uh, lies ahead. And uh, um, and also I think it is important uh, uh, the the, ra the raising of the awareness of uh, of these enterprises that uh, are still. Um, have still some problems to to uh, being um, open about uh, their, their 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 struggles, for examples, for example, and promote uh, uh, their um, joint uh, cooperation with uh, research research uh, facilities to uh, in in collectively find solutions to um, to prevent to 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 help them. Um, to help them um, uh, solve the the obstacles and the constraints they face, uh, I'm saying this because um, 
this uh, in in our uh, in the the continuum territory i i was mentioned uh, and that are present particularly uh, the industry of ceramics and paper and paper and, and pop and paper uh, and also glass they uh, particularly ceramics and and glass uh, they uh, have they they don't plan to 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 invest in other um, in more more in the process for carbon neutral uh, technology because they are not viable they, they don't have the, they are they are mainly SMEs so they don't have the economic power to invest in these in these solutions um, and maybe with this uh, cooperation be between them and the the the, the interfa interface entities and also the uh, research uh, facilities that can be a solution to um, to solve this uh, huge challenge. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kratovilova, anything on skills that you may want to add? Well, I have two two things. One one positive example, and then one probably uh, a challenge. <laughs> let's say uh, one is that, for example, concerning the ceramics, uh, it is an important type of industry uh, in uh, one of our regions, which is Karlovy Vary. And uh, as a strategic project, they chose. Uh, um, um, transformation of uh, ceramics high school uh, so focusing on on students uh, and uh, in uh, creating environment also entrepreneurial environment in this in this area of course it's not done yet uh, the, the 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 school is there but it needs further uh, investments and also um, uh, the human capital to, to, to being able to create this uh, uh, this environment together with the creative industry. Uh, so they, they are combining it together and uh, this may attract new students uh, in order to be able to work in this in this environment in the future because th this is a purpose of or this is an area where the where the region wants to uh, wants to go. So this could be a positive thing using uh, the the school uh, uh, investments or uh, development uh, uh, in this area, and then uh, probably the challenge. Uh, I, I see it as as in the in the energy sector and uh, talking about Karlovy Vary again, as there is no public uh, university, this can be very difficult. Uh, as many many new jobs will probably be, be created, or the, the needs for for new jobs in this sector will be created. Uh, we need to work with the uh, other universities, such as in Usti, for example. I know they've been working on the studying programs, uh, or in 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 uh, other regions to to be to be able to adapt the students so that we have the the new skills for the for for the new technologies. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was also informed that in three minutes we will be shut down. So uh, I wanted to uh, before that happens, I wanted to just. Uh, well, I won't even intend to summarize what has been discussed because I think we touched upon so many different uh, topics and those were quite um, uh, interesting. I would still highlight the, the people side, the human side uh, that has uh, come through uh, through your interventions. It, it always boils down to the people who have to uh, do the transition, live through the transition, survive it and then uh, prosper uh, afterwards whether it is about skills, uh, whether it's about uh, uh, being aware of the uh, of the challenges uh, facing ahead or being or contributing uh, to the uh, to the agenda um, itself. So that was definitely one timing was another topic that came up, uh, which is important. We are at different stages also uh, of the whole transition, but timing comes into play in many from many uh, from many uh, aspects. Uh, and when it comes to the um, uh, TGTPs and smart specialization. What was in the previous uh, in the previous um, uh, financial uh, period? Uh, 
where the awareness or the, the challenge or the need for a transition wasn't uh, hasn't yet come through that much, we will see, and I think there is already a process, a process also listening to you, that there is a process where the just transition itself is being fed into the, uh, the smart specialization priorities, and as well as well, uh, looking back, you are looking at your smart specialization strategies and see which are the areas that you can use to support your uh, just transition. So I think this process is now in turmoil for, uh, at the moment, storming uh, in most of the places, and we will be very curious to see uh, where it takes us and how it will evolve in the in the coming uh, months. Uh, and with that, I would really like to thank to uh, to our presenter and all the speakers uh, that uh, that contributed to this uh, very uh, interesting. Uh, discussion and I hope that the audience also enjoyed and thanks thanks for the audience for the questions that actually came in uh, by during the uh, during the session. So uh, have a have an enjoyable lunch time uh, and a nice afternoon and the rest of the week. Goodbye and thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye. Thank you.